Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Cook Inlet Tug and Barge is a marine transportation company specializing in harbor services with a primary marketing focus on the Port of Anchorage, providing their customers with quality-based service specifically tailored to their needs. The National Weather Service. Good Tuesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 13th of May. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with the very latest weather information from the National Weather Service online at weather.gov. Simply click on Alaska or type in Alaska after that part there, weather.gov slash Alaska, and you'll get the information uh, tailored for your community and your village. You can give us a call on the weather info line at 800-472-0391. And between the weather on Alaska weather, uh, find out information that's helpful to your life on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube, all from the National Weather Service and all around Alaska. Here's what's going on in your area now, especially in the interior, southwest and south central. Red flag warnings are in effect. A lot of those typically expire during the evening hours as the winds settle down and humidity starts to come up. Tonight that may not be the case, and in fact some cases the relative humidity will remain low and gusty winds may prevail as we head through the evening hours. That's uh, including areas like Fairbanks, Eagle, Northway, the Alaska Range, and the western slopes of the Alaska Range as you head into the upper and uh, mid Kuskokwim Valleys. So keep that in mind. That's also for the western parts of the Kenai Peninsula and now including Anchorage. And if you haven't seen yet, the Anchorage Fire Department as of 6 o'clock is restricting uh, burning now. Again, uh, no burning in open pits uh, except for your barbecue grill, I believe, uh, after 6 o'clock tonight. So if you're watching around the Anchorage area, there is a fire restriction in effect as of 6 p.m. this evening. Make sure you check out your burn restrictions with local authorities before uh, burning if you're in those red shaded areas. The breakup map for this afternoon shows a lot of open water up and down the Yukon, up and down the Kuskokwim Valley. Uh, still a few areas up around the Colville Valley and around uh, the Kotzebue Sound region that are looking at at least some ice still in the rivers there, but uh, considerable improvement. And again, uh, quite a different story than what we saw around 2014 uh, or 2013, I should say, just last year uh, for the Yukon. So again, more of a mush out than anything else this year, and hopefully that has been your experience in your village. Fire danger looks to be the big story for this season as very dry conditions prevail. Uh, at least high fire conditions south of the Brooks Range through the Tanana and upper Yukon Valleys and along the Alaska Range in general. Extreme high fire danger, extreme fire danger I should say for the Tanana Valley and northward and also for parts of the upper Kuskokwim Valley and a few locations around the Anchorage Bowl into the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, fire danger again is uh, being uh, worsened thanks to the lower humidity and again the lack of precipitation that we've seen so far this month. So again you're encouraged to be fire wise. The satellite picture across the Bering Sea doesn't show a whole lot of hope for increased chances of precipitation, especially across the interior or south central. You can see the broad trough of low pressure that's working across the western Bering Sea running into a ridge of high pressure here across south and western Alaska. That's guiding any Pacific moisture northward and bypassing most of the interior south central and in some cases even southeastern Alaska. A broad area of low pressure here across eastern Asia is also guiding in uh, moisture well across uh, the eastern side of Asia and the western Bering Sea coastline, but again, most of that seems to be missing Alaska. Look at the visible satellite picture showing a healthy dose of moisture lingering across the eastern part of the Gulf of Alaska. And if you look very carefully here up and down the Cook Inlet and also across the western part of the Gulf, a tremendous amount of fog earlier this morning, about the second day in a row now that's been creeping around. Uh, that drained out and with northerly winds coming in behind a weak cold front, uh, moving across southwest and south central Alaska later tonight and tomorrow. We'd expect that to diminish with northerly winds developing. Across the Brooks Range, you can see some clouds there and also a, a wealth of clouds across the central and eastern Aleutians. Watch this one more time, and again, you can see the fog here across the western Gulf and a lot of moisture working its way northward, west of St. Matthew, west of the Pribilofs, and some gusty winds associated with the front working across the Aleutians today. Some of those winds upwards of 35 to about 45 miles per hour at times. 
The surface weather shows low pressure working across the interior, south central and southwestern Alaska, high pressure across the eastern Gulf at 1,036 millibars. Pretty tough stuff. And on the west side of that, we've got a healthy draw of moisture working up through the bearing. Areas of fog with that, low pressure across the western part of the chain, uh, creating a little bit of light rain, but it was snow across the Arctic coast. In fact, areas around Barrow picked up about uh, two tenths of an inch of snowfall today, liquid equivalent that is, all the way out toward Kaktovik and some light rain around Sitka and some of the northeastern parts of the Gulf. Most areas around the Gulf Coast today were pretty dry thanks to high pressure sitting across the Yukon at 1,028 millibars. As we go into tonight, expect that wave of low pressure south of the chain to quickly work its way into the bearing. At 1,001 millibars, it's weakening, but there's an area of rain and some gustier winds associated with that as it works its way eastward. Now, the focus for this, though, won't be a west to easterly trajectory. A lot of this will work its way from southwest to north and east fairly quickly. That's going to bring the better chance of precipitation again west of the Bering Sea with high pressure still in control of the western parts of Alaska all the way from Kotzebue Sound down toward Bristol Bay at 1,031 millibars. There's been some hints that there may be some convection firing up across some parts of the western Yukon heading into tonight, so we're carrying a slight chance for a shower or storm close to the Alcan border. It won't be very widespread, but it is a sign that conditions are changing now for this time of the season. We have enough heat and we have enough instability and maybe enough moisture to produce at least a few showers and maybe a few thunderstorms. And of course, with the very dry conditions, that's something that fire managers around the state will be watching very carefully. Across parts of southeast, look for a, a scattered areas of light rain all the way from the Copper River Basin down through the Wrangell St. Elias and probably down toward the Dixon entrance. A trough of low pressure will extend from about Haines and Skagway out into the central and eastern parts of the coast. Heading into Wednesday, the frontal boundary out across the west doesn't move too much. It's still working its way northward, and as it runs into high pressure, this is eventually going to fall apart. The pockets of rain will continue across the central Aleutians. A few more showers across Kiska and Attu. High pressures dominating the eastern part of Alaska all the way up toward the Noatak and Kobuk Valleys and also around Bristol Bay. Areas of fog should be expected south of the uh, Bering Strait all the way to the central and eastern Aleutians. High pressure across the Gulf trying to stabilize things, pushing a lot more of that fog a little bit further south and east, and we would expect that at least with light northerly winds we've flushed out the marine layer, so a repeat of the fog at this point doesn't look to be uh, as likely as what we've seen in previous days. And scattered areas of light rain will continue to be an issue around southeastern Alaska heading into Wednesday. By Thursday, uh, that begins to break up a little bit more with high pressure sitting just south of the Kenai Peninsula and very close to the Barren Islands. High pressure also south of Nunavak Island at 1,031 millibars. A few areas of rain across the Brooks Range and then northward cold enough air now across the Arctic Ocean. Both the Chukchi and Beaufort Seacoast will be dealing with at least an opportunity for some light snow once again. With rainfall expected across the central and western chain, you can see that moisture trail extending into the North Pacific is kind of getting stretched out quite a bit. The next focus for rainfall will stay well to our south, but with a controlling ridge of high pressure here at least through Thursday and maybe into Friday, conditions look pretty dry in some of those places we were just talking about as having relatively high if not extreme fire danger. Temperature-wise, across southeast today, we saw readings in the 50s and 60s. Places like Juneau, Haines, and Skagway, even Sitka, pretty mild. Considering that Sitka's right on the coast and it was pretty close to high pressure, 52, not too bad at all. 66, though, in Yakutat, and you can see the influence of some of that continental and very dry air. Places like Talkeetna soared to 70 degrees. Along the Kenai Peninsula, the effects of the fog seen there in Kenai and Soldatna, with temperatures in Kenai at 48 degrees, 55 in Seward and Homer, 46 around Middleton Island, low to mid-60s around uh, the northern parts of Prince William Sound. Further northward, still Healy and Greeley in the 40s and 50s, 56 around Fairbanks, 63 in Eagle today. Northward, still Tanana saw temperatures just shy of 50 degrees, 54 in Fort Yukon. And then you get into the Brooks Range and things change. We're still looking at a very dominant uh, pattern thanks to some of the cold ground, snow on the ground, ice on the sea, and you're stuck with temperatures in the 30s right now. Around Kotzebue Sound, uh, many areas stayed in the mid-30s, including Shishmaref and Kotzebue, both at 35 and 36 degrees, respectively, 29 degrees in Nome today, considerably colder there, and 43 around uh, areas closer to Amonic. Nunavak Island, 39, 51, and Bethel McGrath was showing 52. Bristol Bay temperatures in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You were colder if you were close to the water and considerably warmer if you're inland. In fact, one of the hot spots today around Lake Iliam, 72 degrees. 40s, 50s, and 60s, depending on where you were on the Alaska Peninsula, about 50 degrees in Kodiak. 
Fognac closer to 57 and low to mid 40s for parts of the western and central chain. Now overnight temperatures will hover in the 30s and 40s for southwest. If you're north of the Yukon, chances are you're in the teens and 20s tonight. Nome 25, the Arctic coast in the mid 20s. Places like Fairbanks about 35 degrees. South central looking at 30s and 40s. Tanana 26. Southeast upper 50s to about or upper 40s to about 50 degrees. Kodiak 47 with a high there tomorrow. A pleasant 61 degrees. Southwest looks to be one of the hotter spots. West of the Alaska Range, you could see temperatures closing in on 70 degrees. That includes Dillingham and King Salmon once again. Bethel not far behind at 64. And into the Yukon Valley, low to mid 60s there. North of the valley and into the Seward Peninsula, 40s and 50s. Uh, for the Brooks Range and Arctic Coast, 30s and 40s. Tanana and probably into the Copper River Basin. You're looking at lower 60s tomorrow. South Central, mid 60s. Prince William Sound closer to 60 degrees in southeast. Expect to see high temperatures tomorrow in the mid 50s with St. Paul about 46. Flying weather should bring in a swath of MVFR conditions for most of southeast with some areas of IFR over the mid Gulf and out across the western Bering Sea socked in with IFR. That could include the Pribilovs in areas west of the Bering Strait and a large chunk of the central and western part of the chain. East of that ridge of high pressure and over the continent, now things look pretty good. VFR conditions all the way around, including Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass tomorrow. As you get into the uh, Alaska Range, Lake Clark and Merrill Pass expected to be VFR. Rainy Pass and Windy Pass should also be visual throughout the day. Winds pretty light, uh, at least through most of the morning. May have some gusts develop in the afternoon through Isabel Pass and Mentasta Pass. VFR conditions there and for Tanita Pass during the day. Portage Pass should be VFR. One exception to that uh, visual flight rule, probably Chilkoot and White Pass tomorrow. MVFR conditions at least into the morning hours, but some improvements are expected through the day. Freezing levels show a wide area of very warm and in some cases a little bit wet air across the south and west. You can see the freezing levels already stacked up to about 10,000 feet across the eastern part of the chain and southern parts of the Alaska Peninsula. Across most of the Yukon Valley, those levels may change anywhere from two to 6,000 feet, and we've got some colder air lingering just north of the Alaska Range and the Chugach uh, across the Copper River Basin. Those freezing levels could actually go below 2,000 feet. Icing potential is pretty sparse, though. At this point, it's across the eastern part of uh, Asia and the Gulf of Anadir. Now, we've got a thin strip there along the remnants of a frontal boundary below 15,000 feet, but above six, and below 10,000 feet, but above 5,000. Uh, for parts of southeastern Alaska and maybe a few spots developing north of the Brooks Range. That looks to be pretty light and isolated at this point. Tomorrow's jet stream shows a pretty wavy pattern. Uh, this is part of the problem with our weather right now and why it's relatively stable. High pressure across the eastern part of the Bering guiding any active weather well away from the mainland of Alaska. So the chance of any moisture making its way in here is really slim. It's going to have to undercut this ridge of high pressure. That just doesn't look like it's going to happen right now. The most likely scenario for this to end would be high pressure moves northward a little bit and the storm track kind of cuts off that high pressure system and then effectively shortcuts what we're seeing here in Alaska. So again, right now it doesn't look like the pattern is going to change a whole lot in a way that would bring us any sizable amounts of moisture anytime this week. At 9,000 feet, high pressure sitting across Bristol Bay, guiding continental air southward. So those northerly winds will likely cool things down a little bit heading toward the end of the week. A light northerly flow coming out of the Yukon, working its way into southeastern Alaska. And then the winds pick up as you head out to the west, uh, across uh, the western Bering Sea and across the Arctic coast. You're looking at winds between 35, 50, maybe even 60 knots there. At 3,000 feet, you can see the winds coming in from the north and west around 15 to 20 knots over Kodiak Island, the Kenai Peninsula, and you're also looking at more of a north and westerly flow coming through southeastern Alaska with more of a southerly flow across the central and western chain and gustier winds working over the Bering Strait and the Arctic coast anywhere from 30, 40, maybe 45 knots at times. Turbulence potential then will be limited to those faster moving areas of wind. Most of that's below 6,000 feet and west of the Bering Strait in the St. Matthew Island waters and through the central and western chain. Across the Gulf, there's an opportunity for some gustier winds, mainly across the north and eastern Gulf Coast, west of Yakutat and south of Cordova. Other than that, it looks to be relatively smooth sailing except for a few areas in the mountain passes tomorrow. That's a look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back in just a few minutes with your marine weather. Stay tuned. Water, the signature of planet Earth, essential for all life. Indifferent to our daily lives and commitments, with its many forms and ever-changing intensity, water can abruptly alter the way we live. We need water to survive, but we also need to be respectful of its power. Just as water gives life, it can take it away. For example, 
when there's too much or when there's not enough. We need to understand how water works and how it will affect us. This kind of work has a name, hydrology. It means the study of water as it moves through the environment. The scientists who do this are called hydrologists. We're going to show you the different ways hydrologists study the water cycle and how important this work is to each of us. Rivers of all shapes and sizes divide our nation's landscape. Rivers are utilized for everything from drinking water to transportation to recreation. So it's important for hydrologists to be able to determine or forecast how rivers will react to different conditions. Hydrologists can predict a few hours or days into the future the changing river levels, the speed at which the water moves, and whether an area will be threatened by flooding. Hydrologists make river level forecasts which are very important for emergency managers, engineers, and others who have the responsibility to protect citizens from the effects of floods. River predictions also help reservoir managers determine how much water to keep or release for such uses as hydroelectric power generation, irrigation, recreation, and flood control. Rivers include a main channel where the water normally flows and floodplains, the low-lying area that can get flooded, along either or both sides of the main channel. The boundaries between the main channel and the floodplain are called river banks. Floodplains are sometimes used for farming and industry or for parks and playgrounds. People even live on floodplains. The height of the water in a river or its level depends on the shape and slope of the river channel and on how fast the water is flowing. Rain and melted snow drain into small streams which make their way to the river, increasing its level. When too much rain or snow melt reaches the river, water can spill over the riverbanks, causing a flood. The key elements in predicting floods are knowledge of how much water is in a river, how much more water to expect from rainfall and snow melt, and the ability to track the water as it moves downstream. In the United States, measurements are taken at over 7,000 river locations. In the National Weather Service, hydrologists at river forecast centers use sophisticated computer technology to combine these measurements of rainfall, snow, and river level. This helps them predict future river levels and provides the basis for issuing river flood warnings. Flash flood warning for Eastern Clark County until 11. In order for hydrologists to predict river levels, they need to know where, when, and how much rain falls too much will cause floods. Rainfall occurs when tiny water particles and clouds grow into large drops, too heavy to be suspended by rising air currents. Rain can fall in small areas of less than a mile or broad areas many hundreds of miles across. Determining the amount of rainfall over an area is like solving a big jigsaw puzzle without knowing what the picture is supposed to look like when you're done. Hydrologists use tools like rain gauges weather radar and satellites to figure out which pieces of the puzzle go where. In order to measure how much rain has fallen, the National Weather Service uses over 10,000 rain gauges. This one has a scale which is used to determine the amount of rain fallen over a given period of time. Another type of rain gauge, the tipping bucket, sends out electronic signals as rain falls into the collector that tips when a fixed amount of water has been collected. To ensure timely forecasts, most rain gauges are equipped with radio transmitters, which immediately send measurements to forecast offices. Because rainfall can vary widely from place to place, knowing how much it is raining at just the gauge locations does not necessarily tell us how much it may be raining somewhere else. Because of this large variability, hydrologists use other tools to fill in the blanks. This is where weather radar comes in. Using weather radar can be compared to using a flashlight to find something in the dark. When the beam of light from a flashlight illuminates an object, some of the light is reflected back and you can see the object. Instead of light, radar sends out a radio signal. Water, in the form of raindrops, hail, sleet, or snowflakes, also referred to as precipitation, 
reflects the energy transmitted by radar. The longer it takes to receive the return signal, the farther the precipitation is from the radar. The stronger the return signal, usually the more precipitation. Satellites may also be used to help estimate rainfall amounts, particularly in areas where radar beams can be blocked by mountains. Hey, I'm done! More than half of North America experiences snowfall at some time during the year, and in many northern areas, snowfall is most of the yearly precipitation. Snow is crystallized frozen water. When snow accumulates, there is a large supply of frozen water just waiting to melt and run into rivers. Most people think of snowfall in terms of the depth of snow. For example, weather announcers on TV report inches of snowfall. Hydrologists think about snowfall in terms of how much water it contains. Snow can be very dry and powdery, with only about an inch of water for every 10 to 20 inches of snow. It can also be very wet and slushy, with about an inch of water for every two inches of snow. If we're interested in snow water equivalent, which is how much water you would have in the snow if you were to melt it. We need this information in order to predict how much water will run off into rivers and streams when the snow melts, and also whether or not that snow melt will lead to flooding. We also need to know the snow water equivalent in order to determine how much water to retain in reservoirs during the winter and spring, and in order to make that water last through the summer and fall. The snow hydrologists who gather this information use many kinds of equipment to make measurements of snow water equivalent. Rain gauges, anemometer, telemetry installation right here, gamma detector, solar panel, precipitation collector, pressure transducers, uh, the temperature detector, temperature probe box, air temperature sensor. We've got 52 inches plus of water content stored out in the snowpack. I was waiting for him to say flux capacitor. He just didn't do it, though. Here's a look at winds across southeast. A northerly flow coming down the Lynn Canal tomorrow, only reaching about 15 knots or so. You'll notice those southeasterly winds are creeping up a little bit more towards Stevens Passage and Frederick Sound, about 15 to 20 knots with 3 to 4 foot seas in the inner waterways. Across coastal areas, more of a northwesterly flow around Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather. An offshore wind coming out of the uh, northern entrances and then a southerly flow coming up the southern coastline from Sitka toward Craig at 20 knots. As we get into Thursday, with high pressure moving around in the Gulf, we get back into a northerly flow all the way from Yakutat to the Dixon entrance. More of a northeasterly flow cutting across the uh, central areas of the inner waterways. Otherwise, a 15 to 20 knot wind there with three to four foot seas across the inner waterway regions. Across uh, the north and western Gulf, including Prince William Sound, we're going to have some stronger northerly winds to deal with tomorrow. 20 to 25 knots, just about all areas of the Cook Inlet through Shelikoff Strait. And on the south side of the Kenai Peninsula, including areas in Prince William Sound and outside, you're looking at 25 knot winds with 6 to 7 foot seas. 5 foot seas inside Shelikoff Strait, up to 10 foot seas west of the Barren Islands and north. That diminishes somewhat to about 4 to 8 foot seas. But again, a pretty decent northerly flow and a shift in the weather pattern from what we've seen. As we get into Thursday, the winds become a little more variable west of the Barrens and in Shelikoff Strait. A variable wind up to 10 knots outside of Prince William Sound. Northerly is inside the Sound and seas diminish to 2 feet. And we get that return flow, that southwesterly wind coming back around 10 to 15 knots inside of Cook Inlet. And more of an onshore flow into the Barren Islands and Kodiak around 15 knots with a 5 to 6 foot sea there. Across the Alaska Peninsula now, a light northeasterly flow coming across Bristol Bay. Variable winds north of Cold Bay in the Alaska Peninsula and the Bering. Uh, light and variable wind there south of Sandpoint. Six foot seas there, more of a northwesterly wind outside of Chignik with a four foot sea. That becomes northeasterly as we get into Thursday. Northwesterlies remain light inside Bristol Bay and also down the northern side of the peninsula. Two foot seas as you extend out toward Cold Bay and a six foot sea south of King Cove and Sandpoint on a variable wind for Thursday. Across the Aleutians, a southeasterly wind blowing anywhere from 25 to 30 knots across a large chunk of the central chain and more southerly winds from Kiska toward Attu at 25 knots, 10 to 11 foot seas there. And you're looking at southeasterlies north of Unalaska, 15 knots on a 3 foot sea. As you get into Thursday, variable winds there on either side of Unalaska to Nikolski. More of a southeasterly flow, 15 to 20 knots from Adak out toward Nikolski with 4 to 5 foot seas on the north side, 6 to 7 foot seas on the south side. And southerlies from Kiska to Attu, 10 to 25 knots there. Again, things changing as that southeasterly flow starts to kick back in. 
as you head into Wednesday across the west coast, a south and easterly flow running up from uh, McCoryuk all the way toward Gamble, about 10, 15, even 25 knots there as you reach St. Lawrence, two to four foot seas there. A southeasterly flow across the St. Matthew Island waters, 11 foot seas are expected there in the Pribilofs, five foot seas. A 15 knot wind there from the south on Thursday becomes southwesterly around Hooper Bay with a five foot sea north of Nunavak Island. 25 knot winds continue around St. Lawrence Island on a four foot sea and again some much stronger winds here west of the St. Matthew Island waters. We saw that in the aviation maps that should apply to the western Bering Sea as well. A south and westerly flow coming north of the Bering Strait as we get into Wednesday. 25 knot winds there from Point Hope up toward Point Lay, Wainwright and Barrow. Southwesterly winds also offshore of Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. More of a westerly flow around Kaktovik. That diminishes to 20 knots on Thursday. 15 knot winds all the way back toward Barrow and a south and southwesterly flow coming up through the Chukchi Sea coast. 20 to 25 knots going through Thursday afternoon. Recapping tonight's weather, an isolated thunderstorm may develop around the Alcan border, uh, mainly over the Yukon area and perhaps drifting westward just a little bit as we head into tonight. Chances are the things are going to remain dry, especially for most of the Alaska Range toward the Tanana Valley and the western Alaska Range where red flag warnings are in effect right now and many of those will continue as we head into tomorrow. A burn ban is in effect for uh, the Anchorage area starting at 6 o'clock tonight. No open fires except in a barbecue pit there. Make sure you check with your local officials before starting any fires as fire conditions are uh, high to extreme across a large part of the interior, south central and southwestern Alaska. That does include the Kenai Peninsula and once again the Anchorage area. Out across the west, stronger winds slowly working through the Aleutians as the frontal boundary starts to fall apart by tomorrow afternoon. Behind it, a chance for some rain and gusty winds, a chance for rain across southeastern Alaska and just about nil across a good part of south central and southwest and the interior going into Wednesday thanks to a large ridge of dominating high pressure that will keep the sky relatively clear and bring back more of a southwesterly flow up the Cook Inlet as we head into Thursday. That's your Alaska weather. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.